And that's what proof of the pudding, tasting, EPO impacts, usage. And here's an example of how we assess usage. I work, I'm very fortunate to work with the good folks at the ASP on the Galileo Educator Network project. This is a um, professional development project for teachers in grades three through nine, focuses on Galileo-related activities that teach primarily focus on the nature of science and the practice of science. So teachers receive 15 hours of professional development, and then they get all these resources, and they get information about how they can adapt lessons to promote nature of science, and then they can take them into the classrooms. Well, we do the standard end of professional development evaluation. Would you like? Would you learn? Would you recommend this to a friend? But we also wanted to know what effect this had on the practice. Once they left the PD and the enthusiasm, and they got back to the rigor world of their classes, what, if any, impact did this have on the practices? So we said, hey, let's try this out. Let's see what we learn. We sent out an online survey to all of the teachers at the end of the school year um, from five different sites. There were about 50 teachers. We sent that online survey. We incentivized it uh, with a $25 gift card, a drawing for a gift card. And we said, please, we'd love to get some feedback. Have you used any of the materials that you got from the workshop? Have you used anything you've learned? Have you shared it with others? You know, we just want to know. And so we asked questions like, based on your experience, did you teach these lessons? Did you create new lessons? Did you adapt, adapt existing lessons? Or the other things, did you do none of it? Um, we also asked qualitative questions, reflecting on your experience. How did the lessons go? How did the students respond? What would you do differently next time? This is kind of the tasting. Once you try out the activities, once you've tasted them, you know, what would you do again? Would you share this? Would you say, oh my gosh, this is so good. I want to share this with other people. You've got to try this. Um, or would you say it really didn't work out the way I expected? These are the kind of questions that we really want to know because that shows that this program is having a meaningful impact. That's the way we've defined it. And it's not always easy to do this. We have got a third of our respondents, a third of the participants actually responded to this survey, which is kind of typical for an online survey like this. But we made the effort, and we're going to continue to make the effort. We're going to continue to ask hard questions and try things that are a little bit challenging and a little bit difficult and see what evidence we can get. Again, it doesn't have time to share the results, but I can definitely talk to you after the session. If you want more information, um, my email is in the program zone. You can feel free to talk to me about it. But we're asking questions like this because we think that this is what is needed for us. So, in conclusion, I have three images from today that I want you to remember. First of all, we have evaluation springboard.science or dot org slash science. I also want you to recall the idea of embedded evaluation. So think about ways that you can embed it so that it's seamless, so people don't know you're actually being evaluated, they're just doing whatever they're doing. And pursue that pudding. Pursue that pudding, pursue that tasting. It's worth it. And um, let's see, I think that is my last, yep, that's my last slide. But I do also want to tell you that if you want to also pursue the evaluation springboard, uh, I have a list of tips for evaluators or, uh, about for doing evaluation. They're out in the back, and I encourage you to take a look at those. And I believe I've got a number two for questions. So thank you so much for your time today. We'll have time for questions for our whole panel at the end. So our last speaker today um, is Matthew Winger from the University of Arizona. Matthew will be talking about some specific tools, um, and again, we're trying to talk about meaningful impacts, and so he's going to be talking about something maybe you've never seen before, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, my name is Matthew Winger, and I work at the University of Arizona. I work for Chris Impey, and right now my job is to implement uh, large-scale online astronomy courses, or MOOCs, if you're familiar with those. 
Um, but my background is in informal education, um, particularly science centers and museums. And um, that kind of drives uh, the, this talk, my interests in, um, in data collection, and um, drove my dissertation research. So what I'm going to talk about today is, um, again, based on my experiences in museums and science centers, there are a lot of challenging situations to collect data. Um, so there are, I have sort of four categories listed here. So there are challenging physical contexts. We have informal environments where people are milling around, there's lots of noise, there are people coming in and out, um, people stay for you know, 30 seconds at an exhibit, a minute at an exhibit, they um, stay for an hour at a science center trying to you know, get information about what's going on there it can be very challenging. Um, sometimes you're dealing with um, um, you know, trying to collect data at night. So if you're interested in studying star parties um, and you want to do participant observations, then there's um, some challenges associated with that as well. Um, and with outcomes, uh, things like meaning making, um, identity negotiation, and then um, outcomes from your data, visu making visualizations to convey the data are some of the challenges. Um, also, people are often concerned with things like um, authenticity. Is the information that we're getting true to life? Is it representative of um, real feedback? You know, because when you, one of my concerns as an evaluator, as a researcher, has always been when I go ask people, are they um, enjoying an experience or what they're getting out of an experience? Are they telling me what they think I want to hear? Um, and that's uh, a common concern. Um, and then, um, is it representative of the, the audience? Um, and then complexity. Um, so, uh, visualizing systems, um, complex interactions uh, is, is very challenging. And so, a lot of people um, either shy away from this or say it can't be done and um, avoid it altogether. And uh, I find these situations to be interesting and intriguing. And um, I like the challenge of trying to collect data in um, difficult circumstances. <laughs> um, so, the, the, um, I'm going to talk about two examples. The first example is from my dissertation research. Um, and the, the goal was to understand family learning experiences at star parties, at nighttime telescope events. Um, I wanted to capture authentic participant interactions. So again, the authenticity piece was important. And then I also wanted to capture evidence of this meaning making and identity negotiation. And the, um, if you've done this work, you know that it is challenging. If you haven't done the work, I can tell you it's challenging because a lot of what we find out about learning is embedded in casual conversations. And it doesn't always look like, I learned this thing. Hey, you know, mom, hey, dad, I just learned that this thing is happening. It's not always factual information. Um, and it's not always reported in those uh, interactions. Um, and sometimes it's dark. <laughs> so um, I'll talk about some of the specific strategies that I use um, to collect data in this uh, situation. So one that, um, uh, so I would say that none of these are necessarily new strategies except for the family video blogs. Um, as far as I know, I was the first one to use those in my research, or in research. Um, but the um, self-administered interviews um, were fascinating because you are empowering the participants to tell you what they think is important. Um, it also allows you as a researcher, if they don't tell you something, that tells you as much as if they tell you something. And so what they choose to leave out is often as important as what they choose to talk to you about. Um, and so by providing this autonomy, then that gives them the power to make some of those decisions. Um, then night shot video observations, setting up a, a system, um, a technological system for trying to capture data um, of families when it's pitch black and you don't want to interrupt their experience, but you want to catch those interactions because oftentimes there's as much going on in what they're doing and how they are pointing at something, how they're looking at each other, um, as there is um, in what, what they're saying. Um, and then uh, another um, uh, data collection sort of uh, methodology that we tried out in the study that I think worked really well were these paired family conversations. So what we wanted to do was encourage people to talk about things that were important for their families without, um, again, without sort of having this researcher presence being the overarching driving factor for why they're answering questions or why they're choosing to interact in a particular way. 
So what we did is we found um, um, uh, I took two families and I actually paired them up and gave them conversation cards and allowed them to talk to each other and um, by talking to another family that had similar um, history and similar background or different history and different background, you know, sometimes they would have to clarify things in order for the other family to understand something. Um, but there were sometimes things where they had similar experiences and they said, oh, yeah, I totally understand. We have the same kind of thing. And, you know, it, it elicits um, discussion about interactions um, that you find meaningful and find interesting. Um, then uh, I had them make these family video blogs. Again, that is similar to the self-administered interviews. You wanted to find out, uh, we wanted to find out what was interesting to the participants. And so having them essentially make their own little presentation about the experience at the star party gave us information about how they saw something, how they were thinking. Um, and then uh, stimulated recall interviews, we took the video observations of the event and showed them clips and had them explain what was going on in particular clips. Um, and uh, I'll show you what we got from each of these data sources and how it built a more complete picture of what was going on at the star parties. Okay, um, so the um, pre-visit uh, pre interview was conduct conducted sort of a day before the um, star party event. Um, and then most of the data collection, the paired family interviews, the self-administered uh, interviews and conversations, and the night shot video observations took place on the night of the star party. And then um, the video blogs and simulated recall interviews were um, about a week or so afterwards. So this is an example of a conversation. Um, uh, Max is the father and Priya is the daughter. So um, Matt says, it just kind of looks like a little cut up. They're looking at a picture of Saturn. Which are not a picture. They're looking at Saturn through a telescope. <laughs> and Matt says, it just looks kind of like a little cut out. And Priya says, it looks like something from Star Trek. And he says, yeah, doesn't it a little? Yeah, like, and Matt says, like from the old Star Trek. And she says, no, like um, a puny version of something from Star Trek, the next generation. And um, I know exactly the sequence in the, the beginning of that, you know, of, of Star Trek where they're flying, but so I know exactly what she's thinking of. So I can picture that. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is great evidence that she's connecting a current experience to prior knowledge. Okay, so then um, during the stimulated recall interview, um, I wanted to follow up on this a little bit more. I said, I remember you talking about Star Trek. Um, you, I, I remember coming up at the Star Party you said that something looked like Star Trek. And so uh, Satya is the, is the mother. Max says, yeah, that's my fault. I force it on him. Um, I just, well, I got him interested. And his wife says, it took, though. And Max says, it took. I kept watching them and just having them sit down. They didn't really want to watch it, and now they don't not want to watch it. <laughs> I said, well, which is your favorite series? And they all kind of agreed that Next Generation was their favorite series. And uh, I asked um, if, if, um, Satya, or sorry, if, uh, yes, if Satya was also a fan, it turns out it's a family thing. So it's a cultural experience as well. So not only was, were they connecting to prior knowledge, but she was also referencing a family experience that they had all shared. So bringing that in. Um, and then um, it turns out that this is also evidence of identity construction, identity negotiation. She was reminding, you know, so it turns out that at the start party, she was reminding, you know, or pointing out using this to sort of secure her place in the family. Um, and you can see the interaction um, from the family video. Um, they were talking about their expectations for what was going to go on at the star party. My only expectation was there were going to be telescopes. Well, and maybe some dirty people. And then apparently his wife from behind the camera gave him a dirty look. Um, because he says, what's well, the truth? That's what you expect. And then Priya, naively sort of says, well, like us. <laughs> and Max realizes that she thinks that they're nerdy. He says, like, well, yes, like us. We're kind of nerdy too, I guess. We like those things. We like Star Trek and stuff like that. And Bob, who is the son, doesn't want to be left out of his family experience. So he says, I'm nerdy too. <laughs> and so what we have by combining information from all these data sources is a really rich description of the family culture, the meaning making, the identity negotiation that was going on at these star parties. And this stuff is going on under our noses and all we hear is this. 
And so by following up with these other methods, we get a really rich picture of what's going on. Okay, so um, the other example is primarily an example of complexity and um, uh, using sort of standard data collection techniques to try and do a challenging visualization of, um, of a system. And so the project that I was part of in, at Oregon State University um, was funded by the Wellcome Trust, and the goal was kind of a small one, to characterize the entire science learning system of the United Kingdom. <laughs> And so we wanted to look at a very high level at um, more than, so I think it ended up being 17 different sectors. So museums and science centers, um, zoos and aquaria, um, learned societies, that sort of thing. And then we also want to understand and visualize the interactions within this system. Okay, so um, we started by doing interviews with uh, representative stakeholders from the various sectors. Um, then we did an online survey, we recruited participants, we didn't get enough, so we made some targeted surveys, we recruited again, and then we did these, this analysis and then tried to make sense of the data. And that was a huge part of the effort that went into this, was trying to figure out what the data meant. Okay. And so um, just, I'm just going to give you kind of a snapshot of some of the um, data, the, you know, some of the, the, the visualizations, the information that we produced. And one of the things we asked was, which of the sectors do you think is most important uh, to, the science, to science learning in the United Kingdom? Okay? And they were able to choose three that they thought were the most important and three that they thought were the least important. And so this is what the overall structure looked like. So there was kind of general agreement in the system that schools were the most important, um, that uh, these sort of generic education organizations were next, science centers, broadcasters, museums, nature centers, all the way down and the least important, according to the system, um, was theater groups. And then there are science theater groups out there, and that's that, that was one of the sectors that we were particularly looking at um, because in the UK these things are, you know, there, there are a couple of these that are very popular. Okay, so then what we want to do though is this is an overall picture from what the system thinks it looks like as a whole, it thinks about itself as a whole. But, but what we want to do is dig down a little bit and see what that looked like from the perspective of those individual sectors. So then these three graphs are what the science and discovery center sector thought of themselves in relationship to the other sectors. And you can see that they thought schools were important, but they put themselves on the same level of importance as schools. Um, and we've, um, the three graphs I'm going to show are one from sort of the high end, the middle, and the low end of what the system as a whole thought was important. Okay. So universities were kind of in the middle. We we'll see there's kind of a disagreement here. They also didn't know what to do with broadcasters. There were a lot of people who thought that they were really important and a lot of people who thought that they were completely unimportant. Um, but universities were the most important overall. And then learning societies. You can say it's the same thing. So if we had just looked at one of these sectors mm -hmm. individually, we might have gotten a bit of a distorted picture. But by looking at the whole, we miss out on um, some of the complexity of how these folks think about themselves in relationship to the rest of the community. Um, uh, the last thing I'll show you is uh, a map of reciprocal. Actually, I'm sorry, there's two more slides. Um, the, the, so this is a map of reciprocal interactions. And this basically just shows what, um, when we ask sorry, when we ask the sectors who they work with and how often they work with them, um, the folks in the middle show the most reciprocity with other sectors. Okay, so these, um, so people very often work with science festivals. So these science festivals are, uh, they work with a ton of other people and a, a bunch of other sectors acknowledge working with them. Um, universities seem to be kind of known at the center of it, so a lot of people partner with universities. Um, universities, again, partner with a lot of people. Um, and then it goes out 
and um, interaction from there. Okay, and then this is kind of interesting. This is kind of a resource flow. So when you ask for, essentially, um, think about it in uh, who pays it. You know, where is attention in the system paid? Um, and so negative is they receive more attention and resources from others than they give to other sectors. So you can see that there's a lot of attention and focus on schools. And um, again, there's kind of an order to this. But what's interesting is where universities, so universities actually, so even though they're kind of a central node, they ended up being um, the, the center of, the, of kind of attention and focus. And um, resources didn't necessarily, resources and attention didn't necessarily flow out of university, um, which was kind of interesting. All right. So again, just this is a, an attempt to kind of visualize the complexity of these systems. And so that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much, and uh, hand back to Sam. speakers up. Um, hopefully you saw something that was new, um, interesting, and I just wanted to have a little time um, for discussion, again, because we have three really great minds. Um, if you have a question specific to your project, this is another plug for our workshop, right, which is next, so please come join us. Um, but questions, um, is that in the same room as the workshop? We're going to be in the Pacific Cup. Okay. Yeah, but we'd love to get some questions. Yeah. I have a question for Matthew um, about the study that you did with the families. How many families participated? And how um, many did you did it come back three times? And <laughs> did you get the uh, consent to all of the procedures that you went through? Uh, they, the consent, so uh, the consent was actually easiest. Um, they were extremely happy to help. Um, all the families, um, especially when you say it's for my dissertation, they, um, some of the families actually wanted me to work with them because they wanted their, uh, their son or daughter to kind of see a possible career opportunity for science. So this is what research looks like if you decide to go in more of an education direction, that kind of thing. Um, so participating in that is kind of almost a, you know, career development opportunity. Um, but everybody was super willing to help. Um, the one thing I wish I would have done was to get permission to use the videos um, for presentations. And frankly, I think they would have been fine with that. And you gave me a telescope. Oh, yeah, and I gave them a telescope. <laughs> I, got, I, gave, I gave each, each family a Galileo scope for participating. But I think they would have. I'm sorry? How many families? So I ended up working with seven families um, but only four of them were included in my final study because they, I couldn't, there were two families um, from the very, the very last two families I worked with, I had a really hard time getting in touch with for the later um, data collection, um, or like the third data collection opportunity. And so that was, um, that was definitely a challenge, you know, getting together with them many, you know, multiple times. But I did a lot of the driving. I got them to come out for the star party, but I went out and did the pre-visit interview with them, and or you know I prepared questions ahead of time and handed them a tape recorder and said, hey, when you're just going out to dinner or something, if you could talk to somebody about these questions. Um, so it was it ended up being um, you know it was a small study, it was um, essentially a case study of uh, the interaction between two families at one star party and two families. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you're referring to this identity negotiation. Is that a technical term? Um, does it, I'm sure it has meanings outside one's identity and family. Can you just talk more about that? Um, sure, I can talk to, I'm, I talked to you about what it was for my research. Um, I think that identity research is seeing a resurgence right now. Um, it's, it, there, there have been people who have looked at identity for a long time. So understanding at, at some level it's who you think you are and how, who you tell other people you are. Um, and you, but identity is also flexible and negotiable. And so in different situations, you might assume different identities. Um, and so you play different roles, you'll have different agendas, different, you know, different goals. Um, and so the, the, the one way of talking about identity is stories that you tell other people about yourself. Um, so Sam actually did uh, use identity 
uh, an identity frame for some of her research. Um, there's also some research in museums about um, museum going identity and trying to look at if, if how we are identity how if if our identity as a museum goer affects our experience in the museum. And it turns out that it does, and it's, it's interesting and useful. People who go with kind of a facilitator identity um, experience museums in a similar way to other people who come with facilitator identities. And facilitator identity is somebody who is there not for themselves, but facilitating the experience for somebody else. Um, so that's just one example. I can also uh, find other examples of identity negotiation yeah. in um, media, for example. Identity um, formation in adolescence and media is a very big topic. And, you know, I mean, you think of, of so many people who are scientists now who say, you know, when I was a kid, I watched Star Trek a lot. And that really got me excited about, um, about learning science, and I wanted to be a scientist. There's a whole body of research. There are researchers who study whether scientists, you know, the connection between what you watch in the media and, and the kind of person you, you become as an adult. And so the idea of negotiating your identity, exploring different types of identity during adolescence is, is a very um, important and emerging uh, concept in literature. Yeah. Sure. Hazel Marcus is another person um, of possible selves in addition to if you want to look up some of uh, she doesn't do the work on media, but um, her notion of possible selves in adolescence was kind of the, it was one of the early uh, bodies of research that formed later bodies on uh, children and adolescents media identity formation. Um, mm -hmm. So no, what is in your? Over the, we, we both use the same so We use the frame yeah, in a, a Spartan and Prusa, oh, yeah, which Spartan. is stories you tell others about yourself, stories that you tell yourself about yourself. Other questions? I'm hoping you're stunned by their awesomeness. I, I have just yeah. one, one comment about one of your data gathering uh, approaches, which I think uh, holds a lot of promise, and we don't really, uh, I don't know whether it's been written about much or not, and that is, um, I had a similar experience. I, I studied a physicist who collaborates with elementary school teachers. And I gave him a, a little recorder, and his job was to just on his commute home, just talk into it about, you know, what, what he did in his reforming his physics course today and how that connected with his work with the elementary um, teachers. But these sort of on your own reflections, I, I forget what I called them, but having, having your participants actually reflect on their own without the researcher breathing down their neck or asking them a particular question, you get some really interesting insights into uh, what's important and, and what experiences do for people. And it's become a lot more cost effective with things like flip cameras and things right. that you can yeah. send home. You know, for less than $100, you can loan out these cameras to participants. But then, and maybe this will be a good question for our next session, is then you have to analyze it. And so you all be. <laughs> and so maybe really briefly, I know that this is a question that we all worry about. So maybe have each of you comment a little on a technique for analysis that is not so arduous. I think many of the people in this room would really like to be able to help and do some of this. So maybe some techniques for for this really rich data collection, right? And how you triage that. And so I'll start on this side, because I'm gonna pick on you first, because you thought about it, to give everybody a little bit of chance. But I, I know that each of us probably yeah. would like some help uh, thinking about how we do that, because I can't just sit and listen to hours and hours and hours. So, so one way you can think about making that something you might look for. Absolutely. Um, um, well, one is by not transcribing all of the data that you you know, the deluge of data that comes in. Um, you need to pick out, I mean, it is perfectly acceptable and still valid for you to pick out sections of, so let's say you have conversation data, to only transcribe pieces that are interesting and useful to you. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you're ignoring everything else, you just identify the piece that is, um, that is more important for your analysis. And so, sort of giving yourself permission to not take all of the data you have and do something, you know, everything with everything. 
Um, and so that, I mean, that's, that's really triaging your data by saying this stuff is just, I don't have time to deal with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to piggyback on the ideas around transcription because if you build into your evaluation budget um, uh, support for transcription and you've been careful enough in your research or your evaluation question to know that what you record is likely to produce some gems or something of value. Um, People construct knowledge as they talk. Uh, Vygotsky's language and thought is just is a, is a you know a huge piece of work that really so much of what I hear heard just briefly. This was my only day at the conference, but you know the engagement and the conversation. People construct knowledge as they articulate and as they listen. And sometimes you may not think there's something in a transcription. But if you've got a really good transcriber and you can get good ones now, the software is amazing. And uh, you go through and, and basically code your uh, tra transcriptions for particular things. You can pull, you can count uh, a theme, the numbers of times that certain conversations produce uh, similar or um, unique ideas, and that's where you take this anecdotal conversation and it becomes systematically analyzed and you can actually attach numbers to conversations and do some some numbers as well so um, um, but being thoughtful and strategic about what you record and transcribe is, is huge there are a lot of uh, software programs out there on the market uh, and vivo and um, at atlas that kind of thing. Uh, there, there are a number of them, but I gotta say the most useful tools I have are well, actually several useful tools. Um, sticky notes and yeah. different highlighter pens and a little notebook and a bucket of glue to put on my seat to sit myself down to generate some hypotheses as I am going through my data to highlight issues in the transcripts and to take notes anywhere I think about them. I really appreciate what Tana said about reflecting and hypothesizing as you're, as you're doing something. Um, you know, when, when I finish an interview or two, I might take some notes in the margins to say, hmm, here's an interesting thing. I wonder if I'm just, you know, I wonder if I should, be, I should look through this in other interviews I'm doing. Start to generate those hypotheses and give you an insight what to, what to code. Yeah. And that makes the process, that streamlined the that streamlines the process for me, but also keeps me open to other things that the data might be telling me. Awesome. Well, it is the end of our hour. Um, so thank you very much to all of our presenters.